Hi, I'm Reed Donahue. I'm a volunteer with the Communications Committee. I'm joined by George Stralo, Chairman of the Scope Compliance and Analysis Committee. This is the second in a series of three videos looking at the history of Delta's transatlantic joint venture agreements. In our last video, we left off discussing the events of the financial crisis and the effect that they had on Delta. George, how did Delta respond to the financial crisis? So in response to the financial crisis, both Delta and Air France KLM pulled down capacity across the transatlantic, but Delta did so at a rate nearly twice as high as the European partners. And aside from the capacity cuts, there was one more change to the commercial transatlantic agreement. Right, so by June of 2010, Alitalia joined the transatlantic joint venture. George, when we started with LOA 16, Delta's share of flying was 51.7%. How did these two events affect Delta's share of transatlantic flying? You're correct. So 51.7% was our starting point. And with the capacity cuts and the addition of the Alitalia capacity um, on the European side of the equation, that reduced Delta's share of flying on a 12-month basis to 47.5%. Did Delta expect that their flying would continue at 47.5%? No, absolutely not. The expectation was that the cuts in response to the financial crisis were temporary and that that flying would be restored. If those capacity cuts were restored, what would Delta's share of flying be? So by restoring those capacity cuts that were in response to the financial crisis, Delta's share of flying would have approximately be 50%. And in the last video, you mentioned that there was a new agreement that was signed that superseded LOA 16. What was that agreement? So MOU 14 established a production balance between Delta and Air France, KLM, and Alitalia. And with the cuts that were brought in for in response to the financial crisis, with those cuts restored, it brought Delta's production balance to 50%, and the balance for KLM, Air France, and Alitalia also to 50%. Did we use the same measurement period? Yeah, so we kept the three-year measurement period. And did Delta's production need to stay at exactly 50%? No, just like in the previous agreement, uh, there was a buffer, a 1.5% buffer in this case, and that allowed Delta to go as low as 48.5% as the minimum. I'm glad that George was able to do the math in public. I'll do a little bit more. So 48.5%, but we just said that 47.5% is where Delta's flying was. Was Delta provided any opportunity to come up to 48.5% or were they expected to immediately be there? Yeah, so Delta had three mulligans. Um, the first one was we didn't even start the first rolling three-year compliance period until the next year in 2011. The second one was there was a one-time reset. Anytime Delta's share reached 49.75%, all previous underbridges were discarded and Delta was deemed to be in compliance starting a new 36-month compliance period. And what was the final mulligan? So the final mulligan is a carryover from LOA 16 and it's the one-year cure. So Delta was provided a number of opportunities to get their flying to the minimum level of 48.5%. Were they able to do so? No. So with a one-year head start, a three-year compliance period, and a one-year cure bringing us all the way to March of 2015, Delta still did not reach 48.5%. And so what was Alpa's response at that point? Alpa's response at that point was to file a grievance for the company violating the requirement for minimum share of flying in the transatlantic joint venture. At the time the grievance was filed, what was our share of transatlantic flying? So when grievance 1501 was filed in 2015, our share of transatlantic flying in that joint venture was 46.8%, below the 48.5% required. All right, I think that's a good place to stop, George. In our next video, we'll pick up from there with the settlement of Grievance 1501. Thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you, Reed.